Hola, buenas tardes. Eh, bienvenidos. Mi nombre es Carlos Mendienda eh, y soy el de la Sociedad de Promoción de Economía del Canario. Eh, nombre de la Sociedad de Promoción, os doy la bienvenida a esta charla. Os agradecemos que os hayáis interesado en una charla que puede ser muy interesante para, para todos vosotros. Y nada, os invito a que echéis un vistazo a la página de la SPEC, ¿vale? Porque tenemos muchas actividades con algunos de vuestros compañeros por ahí y más vamos a tener muy relacionado con todo lo que nosotros estamos haciendo actividades, o sea que es interesante que nos sigáis, tanto en la página como en el Facebook, Twitter o lo que sea. Nada más, yo creo que empezamos. Muy bien, eh, bueno, bienvenido a todos. Eh, les voy a presentar a Iván Tejera, que ha sido el contacto que ha permitido que Mike Griffiths esté hoy aquí. Le dejo con Iván que va a presentar a Mike. Gracias, Frank. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos, gracias por estar aquí. Vale, esta tarde tenemos con nosotros, como ya ha dicho Fran Santana, a Mike Griffith. Mike es un reputado jefe de proyecto a nivel internacional. Él es miembro del PMI, del Instituto de Dirección de Proyectos Norteamericano, y eh, lleva durante 17 años trabajando y muy involucrado con todo lo que son metodologías ágiles. Scrum, FDD, XP, todas estas metodologías que os habrán contado a muchos de vosotros en clase, pues hoy tenemos con nosotros incluso al padre de una de ellas, que es la de metodología de desarrollo de sistemas dinámicos. Mike eh, dispone además de lo que son metodologías ágiles, él tiene las certificaciones como Project Management Professional, certificación PMP del Instituto de Dirección de Proyectos, y hoy contamos con la suerte de que esté aquí con nosotros, nos ha costado más de un año y medio el hecho de traerlo y nos va a dar la, la conferencia titulada Solving Today's Complex Problems with Agility, ¿vale? o sea, resolver problemas complejos con la agilidad. Yo no le voy a quitar más tiempo, el viene de Tenerife, justo terminamos de aquí y volvemos al aeropuerto, pero espero que os guste la charla y que, bueno, que podáis eh, sacar algo de provecho, ¿vale? Gracias. Thank you very much. I, I, I hope that was a good introduction. I didn't understand, but I assume it was good. So thank you very much. I'm really glad to be here today speaking to you about Agile project management and agility. I really believe it is the future. Um, we're facing problems today on projects that we can't solve using traditional approaches. And so we, knew, we need new ways of thinking about problems to solve the new problems that we are facing. So today, my presentation is solving today's complex projects uh, with agility. I have this fern um, motif there. Um, a fern is a very simple um, shape comprised of um, something simple that repeats multiple times. And we see that a lot in agility. We have some simple idea like rapid feedback and then we apply it in multiple levels. So there is um, some complexity based on repetition of some simplicity. <coughs> so today we'll be talking about complexity. Um, the complexity we see on today's projects. I'm talking about wicked problems. So a wicked problem is something that cannot be solved with traditional thinking. Okay? It's a new type of problem that we need a new type of thinking for. An example of a wicked problem we face today is how do we make electric car batteries as good in range as gasoline or diesel? You know, Tesla is 30%, 40% there, but we need to a new way of thinking, new technology to make electric cars, you know, just go just as far uh, and be just as cheap as gasoline or diesel cars. So that's a wicked problem. We'll be talking about the challenge that knowledge worker problems face to traditional project management. So a lot of our projects today aren't regular industrial engineering, they're um, complex problem solving. They're what we call knowledge work problems, and we need new ways of thinking to solve those problems. Which introduces us to Agile. We'll be talking about uh, the new science of Agile and the role of leadership um, that's played on Agile. And it's not leadership in terms of a project manager, it's more leadership in terms of shared leadership within the team members. Okay, so moving the, that power to the members of the team. 
and a little bit about understanding change because for many people and many companies this is a new way of working and they need to figure out how do we get from where we are now to a position where we can use these techniques effectively. Okay. Um, my background, I think Ivan went through some of this stuff. Um, I teach at the University of Calgary, I work with the PMI. I've been involved in Agile methods for 20 years now. Um, it's all I do full time. Um, I also do some work for the PMI as well. That's me professionally. Uh, me personally, um, I was born and uh, lived in, in England. Um, I've been in Canada now and North America for the last 15 years. Uh, but I grew up in Cornwall, the south southwest tip of England, about here. And off the coast we have, these are called the City Isles, which are a small collection of isles, smaller than the Canary Isles. Okay. Um, this is where I grew up. And most of the time it's a small um, tourism, fishing type community. This is the town that I grew up in, um, on the coast. And we have some wicked storms there as well. So this is one year ago. <laughs> um, so some really bad weather. Um, it leads me to. I wanted to start this presentation with a story. Navigation at sea in the 1700s was their wicked problem. How do we know where we are uh, on the map, right? Um, there was a very famous in, in England anyway. Um, naval disaster in the 1700s where a whole fleet of ships were wrecked on the Scilly Isles. They thought that they were much further to the east and coming into the safe harbour of Portsmouth, but in fact they were blown much further west by the storm and they crashed on the rocks of the Scilly Isles. So 2,000 lives were lost. Um, back in the 1700s people had figured out how to um, navigate latitude, so north and south, but it was that longitude that was a big problem. Okay? They, they understood the, the globe and the geometry. They knew that for every 15 degrees you go um, east, the hour advances one hour, right? The time advances one hour, and every 15 degrees you move to the west, and the uh, time um, decreases one hour. But they couldn't figure that out because clocks and, and watches didn't work at sea because of the movement of the boat and the humidity um, and temperature changes, you couldn't have a clock on a boat. So they needed to figure out how do we navigate the sea. And so in 1714, the Longitude Prize was, was uh, put up by the government and it was 20,000 pounds, which is worth about 7 million euros today. So this was a, a prize that was offered to anybody that could solve the problem of determining the, how how far you are, east and west and longitude. So that would be enough to, to set you up in life. But if you solved this problem, you were good. No more money and problems. Right. Um, the very first person that came up with a solution was a, was a carpenter. Uh, this guy, John Harrison, um, wasn't even a proper clockmaker. He made wooden clocks, uh, not very sophisticated. And he said, all you need is a better clock, and then you can navigate at sea. And the, the people who were offering this prize didn't believe him. They said, no, that's a wrong thinking. We don't want a clock-based solution. You know, um, we want a mathematics-based solution. And so they, they told him to go away. The next person that claimed the prize, Leonard Euler, had a mathematics-based solution. Okay? He said, if we make all these complicated calculations um, from the sun and the moon, you can work out where you are, sort of east to west, longitude. It wasn't a very accurate solution and it needed really precise measurements of the sun and the moon which is very difficult to do on a boat. Um, the next person, another mathematician, Tobias Mayer, um, had an even more complex way of measuring the lunar distance calculation approach. You had to make all kinds of very complex measurements uh, and it worked in theory, right? It was perfectly impractical. It, it worked, supposedly, but he'd never even been to sea. He'd never been on a boat. He'd only worked this stuff out in his laboratory or in his mathematics studio. Right? Um, in real life, you cannot make these measurements accurately enough to figure out where you are. But it had the seduction of certainty. Mathematically, it was correct. And so 
we, we felt that it was a good solution because the science is behind it, you could verify it. It's like having a perfect project plan. If, if everything works out, then this is how we'll execute our project. The trouble is, nothing works out uh, as perfectly as you would like. So then John Harrison came back and he said, okay, um, I've built you this clock. It works at any temperature, any humidity, and it, it compensates for the movement of a boat. Okay. It took him four years to build it, and it has a, a chain in there that has 2,000 handmade links. Um, it was an incredibly complicated machine. And the, the longitude board price said, okay, we'll, we'll test it. Can you make, can you give us two of these, one to keep at Greenwich Laboratory and one to put on a boat and we'll, we'll send it on a voyage and compare it and make sure it's accurate. And it's two, it, it took me four years to build one of these. I can't give you two of these. So he came back with a, a simpler version, iteration two, if you like. Um, same idea, very accurate, kept time at sea, no matter the temperature, no matter the movement of the boat. Uh, and then he refined it again. Each time it was more accurate. Each time he was dismissed by the Longitude Board Prize, who were looking for a, a mathematics-based solution. You know, um, to, to the board there, he was an amateur. They were trying to split the atom, and he was like a, a butcher saying, you just need a really sharp knife to split an atom. And it's like, no, a knife is made of atoms. They, they weren't interested in a clock-based solution. Um, but he kept going. Uh, and he perfected um, timekeeping pieces. And eventually, his fifth iteration, what's called H1, H5, um, actually successfully solved the, the longitude problem. Okay, so he was the first person to actually be able to allow people to navigate at sea. However, there was a long uh, dispute about whether he should be given the prize. Uh, and in fact, he died. This went on for, for 40 years, and he actually died before they recognized that, yes, he did deserve this prize. Um, so, he was the unsophisticated outsider. They thought this needed a more sophisticated solution, but in the end, this was the best solution. Something that they could work with, using time to navigate at sea but it was an unsophisticated outsider. Today's wicked problems that we face are what we call knowledge worker projects. Uh, and a knowledge worker is anybody that um, shares, collaborates, and manipulates information. So we often see changing business problems, changing requirements, using brand new technology that's not been used before. Where not building the concrete and steel, we're manipulating ideas and information, so we don't have something tangible to, to pass on and share to other uh, groups. And we typically require the collaboration between different subject matter experts, that's what an SME is here, subject matter expert. Our projects today require lots of experts to collaborate, and how do we get people to work in an environment where they're happy to collaborate and feel safe? These types of projects are very difficult to plan and manage using traditional project management techniques. Okay? Another analogy, if you are aiming at a fixed target, we can spend a lot of time aiming, aim, 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 and then you fire your arrow towards that fixed target. Right? That, that's fine and it makes sense if our target is fixed. If we're trying to hit a moving target, however, uh, we have to have a different strategy. Right? And this is like a guided missile. So we point it in the general direction, we let it go, and then we make lots of mid-course adjustments. This is the only way you're going to hit um, a moving target. And this is what we do with our agile projects. We, we get the team equipped, uh, we give them tools around short feedback cycles, and the ability to make decisions themselves, and work directly with the customer, and figure out what's working and what's not working, and we empower them to make mid-course adjustments as you go. It's a different way of thinking. Oh, and I used to work for an old project manager. He had lots of funny sayings. He had this saying, you can't chase a dog with a train. Um, I'm not really sure what he meant with a lot of the things he told me, but I'm using this, this quote here to say, um, if you're trying to um, catch something that is moving, then we need something less structured than something on rails. 
you need to be flexible and move around and stuff. So let's talk about knowledge workers. Um, it's really the evolution of, of all of our lives. We started off as agricultural base, so um, fishers and farmers and hunter-gatherers who then started farming. And populations were dispersed, okay? And then what happened with the Industrial Revolution is that people started moving into cities, the working factories. So it changed the population. So the work now is in the big cities. People moved in from the countryside uh, and cities grew up around this manufacturing. Uh, and then as we all know, in the last sort of 30 years, a lot of manufacturing has gone to India and China and, and the rest of the world is left with design and consulting and coming up with new products or services, um, and banking and utilities, etc. And that's the knowledge worker space. Uh, and this is where we see challenges with our projects today. So, a knowledge worker is anyone who acts and communicates on, on their own specialist knowledge. Okay? It's not just IT professionals, we are knowledge workers for sure. Uh, but teachers, doctors, uh, lawyers, um, in fact, you know, a high proportion of European workers today, 78% are engaged in knowledge work. And if you're not sure if your work or your domain, domain of study is really knowledge work or industrial work, this table is a, is a good way of finding this out, right? Uh, if your work is visible, specialized and stable, then you may be an industrial-based worker. Um, I work with some people, been doing some work for a utility company, and they have people that um, put up telephone lines, right? So telephone wires and electrical wires. Uh, and they're, they're specialist people, they work with high voltage uh, and they get paid to do so many kilometers of wire per week. Right? Their work is visible, it's specialized, it's stable, they focus on running things, um, they have a lot of structure, fewer decisions, and they focus on the right answers. Knowledge workers, however, quite often our work is invisible, right? it's holistic and it's changing. Now we focus on asking the right questions. So less structure, more decisions, asking the right questions. So if you find yourself on the right hand side of this table, then you're really in the knowledge worker domain. Uh, if you're on the left hand side, chances are you're you know, in the industrial worker design. And that's all good, it's just a difference. Um, so what's knowledge work got to do with Agile? Well, knowledge work is governed by this, this domain um, called Human Interaction Management. It's, it was started by Peter Drucker, uh, and he really sort of explained how we need to work with knowledge workers. And some of his recommendations were to build effective teams and communicate in a structured way. And this is what we're doing with Agile. You know, we have empowered teams, and we have daily stand-ups, and we have lots of um, demos and, uh, and planned meetings where we're focusing on that frequent communication. Effective knowledge work aims to create, share, and maintain knowledge and align our time with strategic goals. Well, we have retrospectives and reviews, which is all about knowledge sharing. We have iterations and time boxes and sprints, which is all about effective time management. Uh, so when we look at agile techniques, there's really a lot of commonality between that and, and knowledge work. And if anyone's looking to expand their sort of understanding of agile, then look into Peter Drucker's knowledge work. It's a great source of information uh, on how we can sort of be more effective as team members, team leads, etc. And this all comes about sort of our traditional project management was really formalized at the end of the um, industrial worker age. Right? So the PMI was formed in the late 1960s. Uh, it capitalized on the work of um, you know, Henry, Henry Gantz, Frederick Winslow Taylor, um, Perth, and it hasn't really absorbed many of the newer techniques such as lean thinking uh, and, and agile yet. I'm, I'm part of the group that's updating the PIMBOK guide and we're trying to get agile in there, um, but it's a slow process. Right? Most of our suggestions get removed during the edit process, but year on year we get a little bit more in there. But the whole uh, pinbox sort of refresh uh, is, is slow. So traditional project management has a strong focus on planning. You plan the work and then just work the plan um, and then things should go well. 
which is great for defining predictable projects, but it gives us more challenges on things that are hard to define or things with high rates of change. Right? Uh, and we have tools like Gantt charts, work breakdown structures, network diagrams, and they give us this seduction of certainty, you know, because they're mathematically correct and we can prove them. And so our project should operate just like this. However, people are, are variable. But technology doesn't always work, right? And so we, we very rarely um, have our project plan executed perfectly. And, and those really give us this seduction of certainty because they, they should work, right? This should be, we should finish on exactly Tuesday the 18th of December at 10.32 p.m., right? And we should be ready, but we never are. Okay, so Agile, um, it has this simplicity to it, um, but it's really the unsophisticated outsider, I like to call it. So, we've all seen this cartoon, right? It's been around, you know, I've been in the IT industry for 30 years now, uh, and it was, it was around when I was in, in you know, learning, and I've spoken to people much older than myself, and I say, no, it was around 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, and it explains the difference between what somebody asks for, and then maybe how I, how I interpret that. I get something wrong, and then I go tell somebody else about how to build it, and, and they miss some information in the process too. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's a far way removed from what was being asked for. But, you know, this is key. For anything intangible, we need to frequently validate what we're building uh, so that we can overcome this so that we don't get too far down the track. So we demonstrate the screen or some new version of software or hardware we built, and we say, you know, hey, is this what you meant? Uh, is, you know, is this on the right track? And hopefully 70% of it is, is good, and we just carry on, and the remaining 30% we tweak and refine, and we haven't gone too far um, down that road, and our cost of change is low, and we can very quickly get to the, the end goal as opposed to disappearing for six months or a year and building the wrong system, which is either not used or is uh, not liked. Right. So, um, solving complex problems through feedback and, and adaptation, this is what it's all about. Um, here's an example of iterative and incremental development from Jeff Patton. He talks about how we can start off with a, a sketch uh, and get feedback on that. So here's a Mona Lisa with starting off with hand to mouth, right? No, don't like the look of that. Doesn't look as nice. Let's 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 move that, um, and then you can progressively add more detail until you get to the final product. Um, but this is a lower cost way of confirming understanding and making sure we're building the right thing, rather than disappearing for six months unveiling the final product. Uh, and then learning that there was some defect or, or some better version we could have built. And so we have lots of nested cycles. This is another example of the sort of the fractal pattern we have in Agile. So pair programming, we get feedback on what we're doing you know, within seconds, let's say. So if two people are working together on code, uh, one person says, I don't understand that, or there is a simpler way to do that, or Mary did, did this last week, let's go take a look at what she did. Um, that's very quick feedback. Then we have daily stand-up meetings to learn what people are working on, uh, and then maybe every week we do a, a demo of what we're working on, and every couple of months we do a release. Okay, so we have lots of feedback cycles to make sure we don't build that sort of wrong, the wrong swing type picture. Let's learn about our mistakes early while we can still fix them. So the Agile life cycle is very straightforward. We prioritize our work, so we engage the, the business or the user and say, of all the things you've asked for, please give me a priority sequence so we can work on the most important things first. And then we ask the team, how many of these things do you think you can work on in the first iteration or sprint? And they say, oh, we'll take these three. And then we work through a cycle where we do some planning and development, and we build some increment of functionality. It doesn't typically get um, deployed live, it gets put into some safe environment where we can then get feedback on it. <coughs> so then we do some evaluation, uh, and then some learnings, and we grab the next bunch of features and go around the cycle until we've exhausted the backlog. 
And then every day we might get together as a team and say, hey, what's working, what's not working? Uh, are there any impediments to progress? You know, what can I do to, to make this whole process better uh, for my team, right? So this is the general um, life cycle. Pretty unsophisticated if you're coming from very formal project management. I, I started off um, doing military software development where there was a lot of rigor around requirements gathering uh, and traceability of requirements uh, through to tests and, and everything before you can release anything, right? And then moving from sort of super formal uh, traditional approach to agile, and I looked at this and thought, like, really, is that it? That, that's the whole thing? Um, but if you look a little further, there's actually a lot going on, okay? So I'm just going to spend one slide talking about theory. Project management uh, can be broken down into two theories, okay? The theory of management, um, how do we get a bunch of people um, to, to work together on some product and service? And then the theory of production, how do we build something? And if we look at that theory of production, how it's changed over the years, um, it gives us some great insights into why Agile works for us. So, the very first sort of uh, view of production was uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor. He did the time and motion studies at the Bethlehem Steel Plant. And he figured out that if you get somebody specialized at one thing, and that's all that they do all day long, then that's the quickest way to get that job done. Okay? And that's what Henry Ford took when he built his production line system of building cars. So he, he broke everything down into simpler and simpler steps. And so your job was just to put on the wheels of the car as it comes along. Okay? That's all you had to do. So it's a decomposition of a very complex tool, of a very complex project, let's build a car, into smaller and smaller steps. Uh, and then you just apply local optimization. So the guy that puts the wheels on. Right? So that was a dominant view for 50 years or more. And then Peter Drucker and Michael Porter came along and they said, um, the true value of a product isn't how much someone, uh, isn't how much it costs to build, plus a profit margin, it's really how much someone's willing or able to pay for that. And really, workers are adding value throughout the process as they go. And he introduced the world to the idea of value streams and value chains, uh, and, and sort of customer value, if you like. And then finally, the most recent view of production is uh, the constraints view. And uh, Eddie Goldratt wrote the book Gold the Gold, and he introduced the world to the theory of constraints. Uh, and in the theory of constraints, he said that any system, you could make sort of changes throughout that system, but most of those changes wouldn't yield an overall improvement in that system, because they're not being applied to the bottleneck activity. And any system of construction there will be one or two bottlenecks which are really slowing down the whole process. So the true role of a manager is to figure out where these constraints are and then elevate those constraints and make them go away. And then you look for the next constraint. It's like looking for the weakest link uh, and make that link stronger and then you increase the overall capacity. Companies that decide to improve requirements gathering and analysis and design and yet don't get any better at software engineering, likely didn't have requirements gathering analysis of design as one of their constraints. Uh, maybe it was in construction or, or QA. Uh, and so uh, Peter Seng uh, wrote a book called The Fifth Discipline, which was all about lean okay, uh, and lean manufacturing. Uh, and you know, the role of a manager is to take a holistic view of the overall system figure out where there are any constraints, and then improve that area. So what's all this got to do with Agile? Well, if we look at the Agile life cycle, we see instances of the value-based view. We prioritize our backlog based on business value. Right? And the daily stand-up meeting is, a, is an instance of um, a theory of constraints. We're looking for where are the impediments or blockers or issues on the project, and then the scrum master or, or a leader Right, of a team, that's their to-do list to make those constraints go away. So if we look at this different approaches, the, the PMBOK you know, um, approach focuses only on the, sorry, on the transformation view of projects. You know, it gets that big project and it breaks it down into smaller and smaller steps. That's what a work breakdown structure is. 
Uh, and then from that work breakdown structure, we have developer one, developer two. That's our local optimization of labor. Right? Whereas Agile is actually employing a couple of newer uh, production techniques. We've got the value-based view, and we've got constraint removal. So although Agile may be dismissed as very trivial, very simple, it's actually employing some uh, more, more recent sort of science approaches to production. Okay? The value-based view and the constraint removal uh, based view. So it looks like the unsophisticated outsider, but it actually has some good theory behind it. And then shared leadership. This is a big part of being effective on teams because you know, it's really about teams. Um, so what's Agile got to do with leadership? Well, Agile is humanistic rather than mechanistic. If we look at the Agile manifesto, it says individuals and interactions over processes and tools, i.e. focus on the people. Right? And leadership is also humanistic rather than mechanistic. Uh, it tells us you know, we manage property and we lead people. If you try to manage people, they're going to feel like property. Um, which is a way of saying people don't want to be micromanaged. They want to be led and they want to be inspired and they want to be in control of their work environment and solving their own problems. Uh, it's a far more motivating way of working. Right? So leadership and, and agile are closely related. It's about how do we get the most out of our people and teams. There's another quote here. Management is getting people to do what needs to be done. Leadership is getting people to want to do what needs to be done. It's a huge difference between you know, trying to push a rope or having that rope pulled by the team. One's an exercise in frustration and the other goes very well. Um, I think there's a strong tie between motivation and productivity. Um, and I've created this sort of spectrum to figure out where people are. and It varies all the way from You've got people on your team, or your project, or your study group, or whatever, that are actually a net negative contribution. You'd be better off without these people. Either they're deliberately trying to sabotage, or they're just so incompetent or demotivated that they, you know, they aren't a net gain to our teams. And, you know, I've been working for 30 years uh, in the field, and I've seen maybe two. Uh, out of all of my career, but they do exist. You will come across people who just aren't sort of a net plus contribution to your project. What's far more common though is people who are, who show up sort of, they're there in body, um, but they're not really adding a lot to the project, so they're there, um, but don't do much. And then further up the, the spectrum we have um, active participation, so people turn up and they, they work and do everything that we ask of them. Then we have committed dedication where they're really thinking hard about stuff and bringing in ideas maybe from outside the company or reaching out to peers and figuring out how we can solve problems. All the way up to this passionate innovation. And this is why the sort of Apples and the Googles of the world still worry about startup companies because what can be achieved by passionate innovators is huge, can be extremely disruptive. <laughs> And so, you know, this is a big difference in terms of motivation and productivity we get out of people. And I really think it's our jobs to not only determine where we are on this scale, but also ask where our team members are. And I think it's our jobs to, to move people towards the right-hand side of this spectrum. Uh, and that's what I really see as my job uh, on, a, on a project team. And, and I think it's you know, all of our jobs as team members uh, to try and move everybody further to the right. And so how do we do that? Well, this is where leadership comes into the agile playing field. So leadership is a huge topic. I could e easily talk you know, for an hour or more on leadership or, or days, days or weeks. We're just going to focus on the top three things. But if you want to read a good introduction book to leadership, the Jeffrey Pinto's book, Project Leadership from Theory to Practice, it's a really small book, it's like 50 pages, that's all. It's small, but it's got some really good practical advice in there. So if you're just looking for one book on leadership, that's a good one. So we'll look at these, these top three. Creating and communicating a vision about the project, enabling others to act, and this willingness to challenge the status quo. <clears throat> when thinking about the importance of having a good vision for your project, um, I often sort of introduce a topic by asking people, what happens when you don't have good vision? 
You know, what is it like to drive in fog? What do you do when it's foggy? You slow down, right? You slow down. And it's the same on a project. If there isn't a clear vision, who's rushing? Where are we rushing to? What is it we're supposed to be doing? I don't really know. Let's wait until it's clear. So we need that vision to provide, you know, clarity and direction and allow us to go fast on projects. So it's really important that we create a project vision. It unites and concentrates effort. Uh, and to be effective, a good vision should be a stretch, uh, but achievable. Um, talking to us about some better state we're trying to get to. And if we can have a visual or an image component to the description of where we're trying to get to, that really helps people on projects. Because we have a, a left and a right sort of um, hemisphere in our brains. And our left hemisphere is really good at processing lists and dates and, and requirements. But our right hemisphere is very good at spatial and visual elements. And so if we can create a vision for our project that combines le both left and right elements by having a, a graphical part of it, it can be very uh, powerful for people in creating a good vision. And so quite often you'll see agile projects start off with what's called a product box exercise. Uh, I do this with all of my projects where we get the team, you know, maybe the kickoff meeting, I'd split the team up into to two people, not all the business and all the uh, sort of development group, but mix the people up, split them into two groups, and then say, hey, for the next 20 minutes, I want you to design the box that we're going to ship this final project in. Um, I've never worked on a, on a software, packaged software solution where we ship in a shrink-wrapped box, shrink box, but we're just asking people to imagine what the box would look like if it were to contain or advertise uh, our end result of the project. And we give them some rules. On the front of the box, they can give us the project name, they can draw a diagram or a picture if they want to, but they can only have the top three priority things on the front. And then on the back, they can have 10 to 15 sort of sub-features there. And so after 20 minutes, the, the teams come back and present their boxes and say, I think it should be called the ABC project. And our top priority three things are, you know, this, this, and this. Right? So the teams come back uh, and then each team presents. And why I really like it is because it's visual. It's like a vision for the project, right? Uh, it facilitates early collaboration. We're getting all these people to work together in the kickoff meeting that they may have not worked together before. Um, it, it forces them to prioritize features. You can only have three on the front. So what are the three most important things uh, that this project should deliver? And then on the back, they can have you know, five to, uh, 10 to 15 others. And it's time box for 20 minutes. What doesn't get finished in 20 minutes, we have to leave, right? You only have 20 minutes to do this. And it, it gets them thinking about flexing of requirements because you can't have everything described in this vision box, right? So I like this. I've been using it for a while. I didn't really have a good exercise for kickoff meetings. They were either a little too personal, like share information about you that nobody else knows or unrelated to the project, but this is a great way of kicking off projects that's related to the project. And I would much rather have sponsors arguing about bullet points on a cereal box than three months later phoning me up, asking me why are we built in the wrong system, or this isn't what I paid for, or you know, this isn't what I intended for the project. <coughs> By having those discussions up front when the, the cost of being wrong is, is very low, right? If this is just a discussion. Uh, is extremely valuable. So here's an example of a project I ran. This was a computer system, it was a reporting system. They were replacing uh, an existing reporting technology with a new one. They previously hadn't been able to combine uh, production and sales data on the same reports. So they wanted to replicate all existing static reports, combine that real-time sales and production data, and allow for user-generated reports. So you can take a report you know, do a save as and add a few columns yourself and, and that's your new report. I also worked at a company that were relaunching their PMO, their project management office. Um, it had become, um, it was dubbed, dubbed the process police. Um, they were the people that would come around to your project and say, show me your project plan, show me your risk list, show me your issues list. And if you didn't have one, 
then you know they would give you a hard time about it. And because of that, projects started going round the PM up. They started sort of going underground or sort of off the radar, and the PMO was being deliberately avoided. And so, with this relaunch of the PMO, they never wanted that to happen again. So, their mantra was to add value with every interaction. So, if you didn't have a risk list, no problem, they'll work with you to create the risk list and give that to you, and then say, hey, do you need any help with your issues or your project plan, or can we do something else for you? So they always wanted to do more than they ever asked for, so that people wouldn't ignore them in the future. Um, they've lost sight within the company of all the in-flight projects, because so many were being done sort of behind their back, so they wanted to create this current portfolio view of all of their projects in flight. And they also wanted to standardize best practices and deliverables because all project managers were all doing their own thing and they wanted to standardize on, on how those things were run. Okay. So, yeah, these vision boxes can be very useful in a variety of um, ways. I do some work for a company called iPass. They make the Wi Fi hotspots for universities and airports where you have a very large area with a single Wi Fi. Uh, ID, so you can roam and you're still connected. Uh, and iPass, they're based out of uh, San Francisco and California. And if you walk into their developer cubicles, you'll see these um, product boxes up above the cubicles in their teams. You know, they've taken it a step further. This is who we are, this is what we're building. They, they have them sort of still in their workplaces, and it becomes a bit of a sort of um, guiding sort of metaphor for the work that they're doing. Other things to do with leadership, enabling others to act, yes. Creating this sort of area of trust on the project teams. We need to create a safe environment where people don't feel like they'll be criticized if they ask a, you know, a stupid question, what they think of a stupid question. We want a safe environment where people are happy to say, I don't know what you're talking about, or can you help me with this, or whatever it is. Because otherwise, if people are uncertain, they, they won't be giving everything they could do to, a pro to our projects, right? So we need to build this environment of, uh, of trust and uh, so they feel safe to, to contribute. And um, this, this same old project manager that I started out working for, he had this saying, he said, Mike, you've got two hands to work with, and if you're using one hand to cover your rear, you've only got one hand left to work with. So, and I wish I had a better analogy, but it is true. If we are concerned or worried, then we're not going to be working as fast as it if we feel it's a safe environment and mistakes are tolerated, right? So, um, you know, when there is no need for to, to cover your rear, then um, you are a lot more productive, right? So how do, how do we do that? That's, that's great to suggest. But how as a project manager or a team lead do I actually do that? Well, I have made mistakes. I'll say, hey, I messed up on the status report last week and I need to send it again. Or, you know those estimates we did? I forgot to add in um, third-party testing. I'm going to have to reissue them or whatever. Um, and I ask lots of questions of my team. I ask them, of course, do you have what you need? But I also ask them, where do you think we could fail? No, and if you had to bet um, where the risks will be, or a function that we won't deliver in time, which one will it be? You know, tell me where you think the problems are. Um, because A, I would much rather my team tell me where I'm failing, or where we're collectively failing, than a sponsor, or an auditor, or somebody else three months later. Right? It's, it's good to learn about these things. But it also sends a message that we should be talking about challenges and problems on our teams and make it okay for everyone to talk about those things. So I asked them, yes, where we're vulnerable, where we're not meeting our goals, etc. And by setting an example like this, others realize that it's okay to ask these questions. And we shift the focus from yeah, micromanagement to, to giving out more information and control to our members. So Microsoft Project is a, is a great tool that allows us to do fancy things like um, you know, figure out the critical path and do resource leveling and Monte Carlo analysis. Uh, and I, I really use it these days. Instead, I use... Um, where are you? It's gone. 
Instead, I don't rely on high technology. Right? <laughs> so here's a low-tech version uh, of a similar thing. So it's, uh, it's you know, just parts on a wall, right? And uh, it allows us um, to get the team more engaged in the process. Right. So I don't know what's happening then, but it seems to be working there. Anyway, um, so cards on the wall. Um, good things about it are that we could have our daily stand-up meeting sort of at the, at the card wall, right? So people can't claim they didn't know what they should be working on next because it's very obvious here's the stuff that they should be working on next. They can say, hey, I finished this item and now I'm going to go work on stock search or whatever. So it is technically inferior, right? It's not so good at showing dependencies, not so good for showing resource leveling and, and you can't run your Monte Carlo simulation so well. This one is extremely trivial. Uh, this gives us the seduction of certainty. We can mathematically look at the probability of hitting an end date. Uh, and this one is very much an unsophisticated outsider, but it gets my team engaged, and, and that's the reason I use it. Right? So here's an actual one from a project I worked on. This was getting ready for a software release. We had all the work to do. We had the different team members and the work that they were working on. And here we had the items that have already been finished. Right? So we have our daily stand-up meetings here. Um, but one side effect of this is that this was on the way to the coffee room, and my sponsor walked past this, this wall maybe five times a day. And they would look at this and see where we're at, and then sometimes come and ask me, hey, when are you guys going to start this? Or, it looks like you finished this now, can we see a demo of that? I would never have got that visibility into the project sponsor by sending them a Microsoft project plan or a status report every week. Right? By having this sort of physically in the workspace, um, it, it actually had an awful lot more information flowing from it. And so, you know, yes, it's inferior in some ways, uh, but given the trade-off, I would rather have my team more engaged in the planning, because when we use Microsoft Project, only really the project manager uh, ever goes in there and looks at it. Everybody else is worried about if they change something, then the end date flies out about three months, and you know what's what's happened, right? So it's a better way of engaging the whole team in the planning process. And then the last one, this willingness to challenge the status quo. So we're looking for ways to improve how we're working uh, and get better as we go. So here's our, our life cycle. We have many of these iterations. At the end of each iteration, uh, we have this sort of learn step. Okay? Uh, and the learn step, we, we ask what went well, what did not go well, and recommendations for future iterations. Uh, it's all about doing our lessons learned while they're still actionable and uh, before we've forgotten about them. So rather than doing lessons learned at the end of a project and asking people, hey, think back to you know, last um, January um, or last August when we were doing requirements gathering, how did that go? You know, they probably wouldn't remember unless it was terrible. Whereas if you're looking back one week or two weeks, then you get a lot more information. I used to have what did not go well, and uh, you know, it was explained to me that some cultures don't like reporting problems in the presence of their managers or, or higher ranks, right? And if you change that question to are there any areas for improvement, then you actually get better data coming back. So, fine, I'm happy to have to go do that. Um, other ways we can do this, this is called an action wheel. We can ask people, what should we be doing more of? What should we be doing less of? Is there anything we should stop doing? Is there anything we should start doing on the team? Uh, it's all about learning, challenging, and adapting. Here's an example of an action wheel. They wanted to start co-locating with the business representatives. They wanted to stop um, gold plating the feature outlines and putting too much detail into those requirements. And they wanted to do less of customization of the defect tracking tool because every time there was a new release, they had to redo the customization. So they said, we'll, we'll live with the, the categories that they give us. It's fine for our purposes. Right? So it's all about sort of reaching out to the team and asking if they can improve the, the process that we've got. Um, the bulk of the best suggestions always come from the team rather than outside consultants. Um, there are, we have some rules like no dumb ideas, uh, and let's try something. You know, if you, if you think that you'd like to, 
do an experiment. Well, we'll try it for an iteration or two. And if it works, great, we'll do more of it. And if it doesn't work, that's fine, we'll just stop doing that. And this is um, a great strength of Agile, is that we have these short periods to go try things out. Um, if you're studying genetics, you know, we use mayflies because they reproduce so quickly and you get your results quicker. It's a little bit like that in uh, Agile too. We can try something for one or two iterations and if it works, great, let's do more of it. If it doesn't work, then that's okay too. We'll learn from our mistakes. Uh, and in fact, you know, if, even if they make mistakes, not a big deal, we're, we're still learning. You know, I'm more concerned about teams that don't want to contribute to how we make this better, right? Because they're further down that productivity spectrum. They're disengaged, they're active participants at best. Right? So we want to be pulling them more towards dedicated uh, and passionate people. And then finally, understanding change. So for many companies, this is a different way of working. They've been used to a hierarchical, uh, sort of top-down driven approach where people get given very detailed instructions to, to go execute. Uh, and making a transition to knowledge worker environment, whether it's Lean or Agile, Kanban, whatever you use, you know, is a, is a big challenge for them. And people often associate change with loss. And just like grieving, we go through different stages. So we go through denial, anger, bargaining, depression and acceptance. So, you know, Denial would be, yeah, nice idea, this agile stuff, but I've been doing this for 40 years and it, it doesn't apply to me. Right? I don't have to do that on my infrastructure projects, I don't have to do that on my SAP projects, whatever. Right? And then you also hear things like, you know, well I've always done it this way, you can't, you know, this is what you hired me to do, you can't ask me to change. And they're in that sort of um, anger state, you can't make me do this. And then we get to bargaining. Okay, how about I make my sprints six months long? Is that okay? You know, they're, they're not really entering into the spirit of it, but they're trying to bargain their way into it. So they want to hang on to how they do things, but at the same time, maybe show a little bit of winning, but it is, it's not coming. Uh, and then quite often people try it and, and think this isn't working, this, nothing makes sense. And finally, acceptance. Okay, now I see why we want to do this, we've seen the benefits, it's, it's working well. Uh, and so quite often, when I'm working with companies, you know, I'll, I'll meet different people and, and I'll be able to figure out, okay, they're in bargaining or they're in denial or they're just angry or whatever. And it's useful to know these things because we often get personally attached to a change and we don't understand why everybody else doesn't want to, to take up this new approach, right? And it's because they're coming from a different place, right? And they may have to go through these different le uh, levels. Uh, another model I use a lot is called the Satir uh, change curve. And uh, if you think about if you've ever uh, learned a foreign language or learned to play a musical instrument or learning to drive, we start off excited about it, I'll be able to go see all my friends or go, you know, dating online for more candidates or whatever this new language will give me. And so we're, we start off excited uh, and then we try it, so the, our first driving lesson, and it's like, wow, this, this is hard, right? This, this isn't as much fun as I thought it would be and it's a lot harder. So we have this, it doesn't matter what it is, any skills acquisition usually follows this curve. We start off with a high comfort level, then we go through this period of confusion and loss, right? And then as we do more of it, we have good days and bad days. So it's called turmoil and despair, right? So some things go well, some things go terrible. You wonder, why on earth did I want to learn to drive or, or you know, learn the cello or whatever it was, right? And then we, we grow out of this at the end, okay? And any skills acquisition goes through this, and so companies adopting Agile, we should show them this and say, that's okay, you know, things aren't going well, you're here, but it will get better, right? You don't tell them you're over here and you're about to go through turmoil and despair. You, you tell them, no, you know, you're doing okay, you're here, things will get better. No, but seriously, it is useful to show a curve like this to people, to explain that we should expect some different comfort level, uh, and there will be periods where things don't seem to be going well, and that's just normal, right? Then we'll, we'll grow up out of this and things will be better. 
um, or yeah, Foxconn. So anybody with a, an iPhone or an iPad or, a, or an Apple anything, right? Pretty much all made at Foxconn. And this is an example of a company that doesn't handle change well. Okay, so this isn't what we want to do. So this is a Foxconn factory. Um, do you notice anything unusual about the factory? Well, a lot of nets at this factory, right? Uh, and the nets are to catch people who are committing suicide. They had a lot of problems with people jumping off the roof because as demand for Apple products increased, they just upped the hours that people were expected to work. Right? No, no consultation, consultation, no sort of increased workforce. Their response to the change was to work people harder uh, and with terrible results. Right? And, uh, and this wasn't the solution to the problem. The problem needed to be fixed by not working people 80 hours a week right, in bad conditions. So that's, that's how not to do it. Um, how we should do it, and, and how I've seen more successes. I used to, you know, I've been doing Agile now for 20 years, uh, and I used to just try and introduce the practices to people, uh, and then didn't understand why not everybody wanted to do this. Uh, and it took me a little while to figure out that, yes, we have a strategic thing, where, uh, path, where we establish the need, okay, you want to get better at software development, we create a vision for what needs to be done, communicate that vision, plan and create short-term wins, and then consolidate the improvements. But unless you take into account the human element of that, it will just be met with lots of resistance. And since I started focusing on getting people involved in the change, running the change, getting them, you know, um, encouraging participation, forming a change coalition, providing some rewards and incentives, and making sure we institutionalize the changes and provide training and, and make it an ongoing improvement <coughs> process, then suddenly all these agile transitions went so much easier. The message, you know, was still exactly the same. Here's how we introduce agile, right? But just by engaging the people better, uh, we went from, the company I was with went from, you know, 25% resistance to, to less than 5% resistance in companies and the people that we met and dealt with. So uh, please think about the, you know, the people side of any kind of change that you, that you roll out. Anyway, that's, that's my slides. Um, I'm here really to say that today's projects have lots of wicked problems for traditional approaches. Right? We're in this space now where we're building new things with new technology and it hasn't been done before. And we have to do that because, you know, we're competing globally now and if this was easy, it would have been done already. So typically we're trying to solve very complex leading edge problems. We can solve those problems iterative and incrementally using agile and agile approaches. Uh, changing how people work though, you know, requires a lot of cooperation and support so that they, they follow us along this journey uh, that we have. So those are my main points. Um, I think my contact information has already been circulated. I'm going to make these slides available uh, as a PDF, so you'll get all of the slides and references and everything. Um, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you may have. I would like to thank my Griffiths for, for his talk. I think it is a very good opportunity to have his to have him here and to to share uh, his knowledge and his experience. Let's hope we can come again. Thank you.